Hi, my name is Conica Clarnas and you're watching the video on the characteristics of microtrophias. Now, microtrophia is a small angle strabismus that generally measures less than 10 prism doctors, so it's about 5 degrees or less, and despite the patient having a manifest strabismus, the patient still has BSV. Now, because it's such a small angle, it's usually not easily observed. And to pick up that a child has a microtropia, we often need a screening program to detect that there is strabismus present or there's a reduction in visual acuity, which then leads to a referral and discovery of a microtropia. If we take a look at the image here to the right, she looks cosmetically very good and relatively straight. But when you perform the cover test, it's clear and evident that she has a manifest deviation. Let's have a look at that. Note that the left eye is going to be covered, so watch the right eye and see if you see a movement on cover. And there you see the eye moving out. Again, slight movement out. Now, before we move on, I just want to talk about the synonyms. A microstrabismus also is a microtropia. They're interchangeable terms. You can also distinguish the direction of the deviation. You could indicate that the patient has a microesotropia or a microexotropia. The other term that may be utilised is monofixation syndrome. Some will utilise this term to mean a microtropia but others will utilise the term to indicate that the patient is actually straight but has central suppression and therefore prefers to fix with one eye over the other. The patient with significant anisometropia is the patient who we're referring to here. So a patient with anisometropia may be straight, but if they have central suppression, then technically they're preferring fixation with one eye and therefore they're monofixes. Okay, let's discuss in a little bit more detail the characteristics of a microtropia. So as I just mentioned and you saw, we're expecting a manifest deviation of about 10 doctors or less. Now, some of these patients will also have an underlying heterophoria. So they'll not only have the manifest deviation, as we saw that uh, girl just earlier, but when you perform the alternate cover test, you'll actually find an even greater ESO movement, which indicates to you have both the manifest strabismus and the latent strabismus together. And the reason these patients can have a combination of manifest and latent is because they do have monocular functions and they do have peripheral fusion and therefore they're able to have both a manifest and a latent component to their deviation. Now, almost all cases of patients with a microtropia will have an isometropia. Some patients may have foveal suppression. In terms of retinal correspondence, some will be NRC and some will be ARC. Very importantly, patients with a microtropia will have BSV. They won't be able to demonstrate to you by foveal fixation, but they will demonstrate monocular functions. So this means that if you give them a random dot stereoacuity test, they will fail it, but they will pass a contour line stereoacuity test because it doesn't rely on the patient being bifoveal. These patients also demonstrate sensory and motor fusion. So despite the fact that you have a small angle strabismus or manifest strabismus, you will be able to measure a fusion range in these patients. A couple more things. Some of your patients will have eccentric fixation and or will develop some level of amblyopia. So some of the key points there is that we have a small angle strabismus, we're highly likely to find an isometropia, and we'll find that the patients have monocular functions, but they will certainly fail tests that require bifoveal fixation, but pass tests that do not rely on bifoveal fixation. In order for a patient to be classified as having a microtropia, they must have BSV in the presence of a manifest strabismus. 
No other patient with a manifest strabismus can achieve BSV without the neutralization of the angle. And what I mean by that is putting them on the synoptophore and bringing them fovea to fovea, or putting up prisms and bringing them fovea to fovea. A microtrope will show you in clinic that they have BSV without needing to neutralize the angle of the deviation. Now, in terms of etiology, you'll recall that when we're treating an infantile esotropia patient, we're aiming for a microtropia. So we can have a secondary or a primary microtropia. The primary microtropia is one where we suspect that anisometropia is the cause of the deviation. Now, if you have a patient that doesn't have anisometropia, then it's relatively unknown why they have that microtropia. But in almost all instances, the microtrope will present with some level of anisometropia. So the secondary uh, microtropia is that which develops postoperatively, where we have, as the example of the infantile ET, a residual isotropia. The patient develops BSV, and then we classify that patient as having a post-operative microtropia, which is a secondary microtropia. Now, when we diagnose a patient with a microtropia, we can further subclassify the patient as either having a microtropia with identity or a microtropia without identity. The key difference between the two is one has eccentric fixation and the other does not. The patient with a microtropia without identity has no eccentric fixation, so they have central fixation, and the patient with identity has eccentric fixation. What this means is that we'll have different cover test results for each of these types of microstrabismus. Let's have a look at this in a little bit more detail. Let's start off with the microtropia without identity. This patient, as I just mentioned, will have central fixation. If we have a look at the example here, here is the fovea, here is the CIP. Let's assume it's a 10 diopter microesotropia. And we perform a cover test. What do we expect? We expect the eye to move out to take up fixation. Now, in terms of retinal correspondence, the patient may or may not have ARC. So if um, they have ARC, it'll be harmonious. It'll be here at the CIP, giving the patient BSV. If they have normal retinal correspondence, you would obviously expect that this CRP point would give diplopia, but it doesn't. What we have instead are extensions of paninfusional areas, which leads to the patient maintaining BSV, despite the fact that they have a small angle esotropia. So in both these instances, whether the patient has ARC or NRC, you should be able to demonstrate stereopsis and sensory and motor fusion. Now, you'll recall from your earlier inquiries that the four prism doctor test is utilized to confirm the presence of a microtropia. If performed on the patient with a microtropia without identity, they will have a positive result for a microtropia. In other words, they'll have a failed response. However, it's not a necessity to perform a four diopter prism test on a patient with a microtropia without identity. I'll come back to the reason for that in a moment. Moving now on to the microtropia with identity. I mentioned before that the key difference between the two types of strabismus is the fixation. This patient with identity has eccentric fixation. And that eccentric fixation point will be exactly where the contralateral image point is. What does this mean for the cover test? When you cover the fixing eye, we know that eccentric fixation is a monocular condition and is a pseudophobia under monocular conditions. So when we do cover this eye, the patient will have no movement to take up fixation. That eccentric point will take on the role of the pseudophobia during the cover testing procedure. So we see here that no manifest deviation is detected on cover test. So another key difference between the two conditions is that microtropia without identity gives you a movement on cover test 
and microtropic identity gives you no movement on cover test. Now this is where the four prism diopter test is essential. Now with the microtropia with identity, you need to prove at some point that the patient has a manifesto business. And the cover test is not giving you confirmation of a manifesto business. And the only way you can confirm that there is a microstrabismus present is by using the full prism diopter test. And again, these patients will have a positive result for microtropia. They'll fail the full prism diopter test. And the reason that it's absolutely necessary to perform the full diopter prism test in patients with this subtype of microtropia is that we do not have confirmation on cover test that the patient has a manifesto business. Whereas with microtropia without identity, we've already detected the microstrobismus or the manifesto business on cover test. So the four diopter is slightly superfluous in that patient. It doesn't particularly assist us in diagnosis, it just confirms what we saw on cover test. Now, finally, in terms of binocular functions, we expect similar outcomes in relation to stereopsis and motor and sensory fusion to patients diagnosed with a microtropia without identity. In patients with microtropia with identity, they tend to have ARC rather than normal retinal correspondence. So we will find that uh, there is ARC and this matches the eccentric fixation point and the contralateral image point. So we'll have harmonious ARC. I want to mention one more thing in relation to the microtropia with identity. What I didn't mention a moment ago about the four doctor prism reflex test is that a patient who has monofixation, in other words, who is straight but has central suppression due to an isometropia, will also fail the four doctor prism test. So in performing the four doctor prism test in a patient who gives you a cover test of no movement, that doesn't guarantee that the patient has a microtropia. It indicates that it's either a microtropia or that you have monofixation. It is therefore necessary to then look at visuoscopy and confirm that there is eccentric fixation. And it's when you have that positive four doctor prism test with eccentric fixation that you have the absolute confirmation that the reason you saw no movement on cover test is because the patient wasn't centrally fixing. Okay, so overall, the diagnosis of a microtropia relies on a variety of results. Now we know the definition is we need a manifest business with BSV. So these are two critical assessments that we need to perform. The cover test, which looks for the manifest business, and we need to look for binocular functions. And when we see that we have a manifest business with binocular functions, then we have a microtropia. We should also find that the visual acuity will be reduced because amblyopia will have developed. However, what about the patient who has a normal cover test? How do we then work out that the patient has a microstrabismus? Well, you'll have clues that alert you to the fact that this patient is likely to have a microtropia. So the cover test will be normal, or you'll usually find an esophoria, but visual acuity will be indicating there's likely amblyopia. There will be reduced visual acuity in the eye that has the microtropia. In addition to this, you'll find that the patient will fail a random dot stereoacuity test. So if you have a patient with reduced vision in one eye who fails a random dot stereopsis test but has an esophoria on cover test and you do not detect a manifest business, you have to be thinking that this patient must likely have a microtropia to explain the reduction in the visual acuity and to explain the lack of passing of a bifoveal test. In which case, you'll then proceed to do visuoscopy and a full prism doctor test and the cycloret, which will tell you that the patient has an isometropia. So you should be able to easily detect whether a patient has a microtropia 
with identity or a microtropia without identity. Okay, that brings us to the conclusion of this video. Thank you for watching.